Hey there, and welcome back to RimWorld. My name is Pete, and today we complete another episode of our RimWorld adventure in the tropical rainforest with the Believers of Boyo. Last time we left off after having our first baby, Ellie, daughter of Squeaks and Took, was born. We also housed some royal guests, a baron and his entourage, and while it was not always easy, we succeeded in keeping them happy, at least happy enough for them to reward Wyatt with a bit of honor. Near the end of the episode then, we had two donkeys wander in, willing to join us, and from reading the comments of the last episode, most of you were in favor of keeping them too. So let's start things off here by giving them some names, as always chosen from the list of Patreon supporters in the naming rights tier and above, as we welcome Glomus and Loris to the colony of Red Chapel, who we will now be able to use as riding or pack animals. Now, the big project for today's episode is to move everyone into our new mountain base, which might sound easy at first, but considering that we have a baby to take care of, not to mention that we are also pretty low on food and still need to construct a pen for our new donkeys, well, don't expect this to be done in the matter of just a few days. Now, one thing we are also accepting with all of these construction projects here is the absolute destruction of the Meditation Psy Focus bonus of the Large Nature Shrine. As you know, anything constructed inside of the Shrine's radius will just completely tank that value. But I think in Wyatt's case, that is actually somewhat acceptable. Most of his Psy casting abilities have a very low focus cost. The only exception would be Word of Joy, but I'm hoping that we won't need to cast it as frequently as we did in the last episode. During the episode's first night then, we already see four of our six colonists sleep underneath the mountain. Light and Kevin, meanwhile, have made themselves comfortable in our old base. On the following morning then, we once again have a bit of trouble with an elephant. Took's hunting spree took place just a little bit too close to our other colonists, who have now become the target of the elephant's rage. Thankfully though, one of them is Wyatt, and the man fears no elephant, and with good reason, as you can see by the outcome of this fight. This elephant will then also be the first animal to be butchered in our new base. However, before it can come to that, another psychic drone strikes the jungle. This time, however, it thankfully only affects females, which is still bad enough considering it's a high-intensity drone, and considering that Squigs is the one getting most of the work done around the base. However, to make up for it perhaps, we stay on the topic of elephants a little while longer, as we just had one self-tame, and with that kind of accelerate the plans that I already had for this series. Yes, I think elephants might be an animal worth tapping into for this one. This one here signifies their arrival with an absolutely majestic name. The Earl of Bronze now joins our flock. So, your highness, welcome to the colony of Rat Chapel. To be honest, aside from thrumbos, elephants are probably the best animal in the game, if you can keep them fed. Not only can they be fully trained, just like our bears, they are also pack animals for caravans and they have the highest carrying capacity in the game. And finally, they can also be used as riding animals, like horses or donkeys, so they really are the jack of all trades. Combine that with the fact that they are very capable in combat too, as they are spotting hit point and damage values that are only exceeded by the Megasloth and the Thrumbo, and I think this might very well be the beginning of an animal army unlike anything we've ever seen before. Now, you may have just noticed it in the background, Kevin has suffered a mental break. As you can see, he was insulted by Light, who criticized Kevin's fighting methods, and perhaps with good reason, as Kevin is incapable of violence and doesn't actually fight at all. So, that is one pair of hands less to help us move into our new home. Still, over the course of the day we are making good progress, even if another word of joy side cast is required to keep Squigs happy. The only problem is, as the night sets in, so does the plague. Yes, it was only a matter of time until some of our colonists were affected. This time it hits light, and most unfortunately, our resident medical specialist Kevin, who to make matters even worse, is still wandering around in sadness. And while normally I like to let mental breaks run their course, this time we just can't have that. The plague is a deadly disease and it can kill fast, so I see no other option here but to force Kevin to snap out of it by arresting him. After releasing him again, Kevin can then first tend to himself with regular medicine. Yes, considering the medical skills of the rest of the colony, that is still the best option. And then we can have him tend to light shortly after. Now, unfortunately, because we're lacking any additional beds and because I don't want any of them to move around any further, they will have to spend the night together, resting and recovering together in the royal bed of the old baron's bedroom. On the next morning, then, a gift from the skies reaches us, plenty of baby food, as if someone in orbit was aware of Ellie's recent birth. Either way, we will gladly take it, even though it is probably much more than she will ever need. 
Kevin and Light, meanwhile, are doing well, at least in terms of recovery. As you can see, I already felt confident enough to switch back to herbal medicine, as the immunity of both guys is progressing much faster than the disease itself. In our new base, meanwhile, you can see it, we are furnishing a small common room. The plan is actually to use the entire area currently filled by those six small rooms to become one big common room eventually. But for the time being, this small patch here will have to be enough. Work on our animal pen, meanwhile, continues slowly as we still need to chop down quite a few trees. And so, before the next night can set in, let us accept a quest that was very popular in the comments of the last episode. Obviously, we can safely accept the shutting down of all electrical devices for five and a half days. And I think the reward that we are going with here will indeed be the field hand. And I also already have a good idea who to give it to, but more on that later. For now, the EMI blast arrives and we are completely unaffected and a few seconds later the field hand arrives as well. The psychic drone then also comes to an end, making Squeaks and Ellie much happier. And so we rejoin the colony on the next morning, as we can see that Took is feeding his baby for the first time. Yes, it is actually possible to override his childcare incapabilities. We just need to put his feeding settings to urgent and have some baby food available. And so Took can now finally take some of the load off of Squeaks and also build a bit of a relationship with his daughter in the process. On the plague front, meanwhile, we have good news. Kevin has already developed an immunity, and while Light is not doing quite so hot at the moment, he will most likely make it too, even though the plague's consciousness penalty has completely knocked him out for the moment. Kevin, meanwhile, is back to his old ways, once again on a mental break because of being insulted. I guess that's what you get for having to share a bed with a psychopath. Luckily, though, Kevin is not quite the medical specialist that Wyatt is, so I do not expect the tantrum here to be all that damaging. A short while later then, our animal pen is finally finished. Even with the cocoa trees, it is now providing much more nutrition than our animals will ever need, and that includes our elephant, the Earl of Bronze, who is not technically a pen animal and therefore not counted in the food consumption in the lower left corner. In the evening then, a light has reached immunity as well, and Wyatt is in the process of carving out another small room, this one the beginning of what will eventually become our new storage room. But for now, there is another construction project a bit more important than that, as we can see Squeaks work tirelessly through the night to build a wooden pew, a lectern and an altar. Yes, it is ritual time for the believers of Boyo. In the early morning hours, with everything constructed and light no longer incapable of walking, we are now having ourselves our very first pain party. Just a social gathering with Kevin as the speaker. The outcome chances here are as good as we can get them at the moment. And not only could this be the source of our very first ideology development point, if it is, there is also a 50% of another colonist joining us, which could come in handy, because at the moment it definitely sometimes feels like we have more work to be done than people who can do it. And so the ritual begins with Kevin giving a short speech about togetherness and all that, and afterwards our pawns just mingle and celebrate a bit. After all, we did just overcome a deadly disease, so I think there is reason enough to be happy. And indeed, eventually the pain party is deemed a fun event, and so we gain our very first ideology development point. And for the next six days, all of our colonists also receive a small plus five mood bonus. My hopes have also come true, and a wanderer has been attracted by the ritual. Unfortunately though, it looks like we have ran into a bit of a bug, as that wanderer never actually materialized. Now, you know I normally don't reload my saves, but in this case I tried it multiple times, even with death mode enabled. And I actually also received two error messages that I will leave linked in the comments down below. Unfortunately, I'm not an expert on these, so I would appreciate any help you can give me. It looks to be a null reference issue as the quest tries to generate a pawn. And it looks to be tied to the adjust xenotype for factionless pawn method. And this is roughly where my expertise comes to an end. So far, I have done pretty much everything from disabling the few mods I have active to a full reinstall of the game. I also tried it with a backup save that I made right at the beginning of episode 1. Unfortunately, all of it to no avail. This quest just wouldn't generate a new colonist, no matter what I tried. So in the end, I had to resort to death mode to spawn one in, and I promise I only did this once. So, meet Brandon, named after patron supporter Brandon Williams. Now, Brandon is psychically sensitive and a jogger, so far so good, however, he's also staggeringly ugly and incapable of animals, art and plant work. 
All in all, he is very much a workshop guy, if you will, with passions in intellectual, crafting and construction, not really capable of anything else, and I had actually hoped for a skilled socializer, just so we have someone else but Kevin to be sent out on trade caravans. Now, arguably, the most interesting thing about Brandon here is his social tab, however, because as you can see, and I swear I did not edit this in any way, he is actually the ex-lover of none other than Specs. So the guy knows what it means to be with a bloodthirsty psychopath. Looks to me like a lot has happened since we left the Cult of Jinx. In any case, this gives him some common ground with the rest of the colony. However, it will be some time until he actually joins us. You may have noticed the timer ticked down in the lower right corner. We will now send Brandon out on a quest that we received from the Empire last episode. They need a helping hand, and what better way for Brandon to prove himself in his charitable ways? The fact that they are looking for a laborer and that Brandon can be very much classified as one definitely makes this fit quite nicely. This time we are also not going for honor or goodwill, but instead for glitter world medicine. Disregarding the small amount of silver here, I think this would be what the believers of Boyo are after in quest rewards, improving their means to help others in the future. And so, just a few moments after arriving in Rat Chapel, Brandon is sent onto a shuttle and leaves again. He will be back in 20 days. The Glitter World Medicine, meanwhile, arrives immediately. And so, we spent the next few hours the way we're used to, planting rice and hunting animals, until, in the process of set hunting, we finally receive our very first raid. Yes, it took us three and a half episodes to get here, but now here it is. We are attacked from three sides at once by a group, or rather three of them, of impits. Now, as you can see, this raid does not seem to be too dangerous. Three groups, but only four to five enemies, and all of them equipped with melee weapons. Still, impits are not to be underestimated, as members of this xenotype have the rather annoying ability to spew fire. At the same time, they are also the worst candidates when it comes to fighting in melee, as they have both the weak melee damage as well as the slow wound healing gene. Still, they are fast, very fast, and that means they will reach us quickly, so here's what we're going to do. As Took, Squigs and Wyatt take a position outside of our base, Light jumps halfway across the map, just to attract the attention of the two groups arriving from the north. And as you can see, they do arrive in speedy fashion, but we have a plan, and it involves Berserk pulsing the chief impet. While the rest of them are covered mostly in shoddy clothing, this one comes with plate armor, so this should hopefully keep our enemies busy for a while. Meanwhile, as you can see, the group from the south has reached our base, but they too are not well protected, and so the first of four enemies goes down quickly. Unfortunately though, now we get to the fire breathing part, and as you can see, this immediately wreaks havoc, as anyone on fire will just run around wildly trying to beat out the flames, and until they do, they won't think at all about fighting. Luckily, the presence of Wyatt is enough to send this group fleeing nonetheless, while the Earl of Bronze is holding up the enemies by the river. This right here, a lovely example of just how incredibly tanky elephants can be. Fire spitting, multiple melee attacks, no problem, the Earl has got this under control. Wyatt, meanwhile, does his best to clear up the rest of the enemies, and eventually we've got both groups fleeing, albeit with parts of the map on fire, but thankfully a rainy thunderstorm has already set in. Now, interestingly, one of the enemies who's downed but not dead is the Berserker Chief of the Impets, and so we are now going to imprison him, turning our small new storage room into a temporary prison cell. Kevin, meanwhile, is patching up the injured, Wyatt did thankfully not sustain any damaging injuries. With our bears and the elephant, meanwhile, the story is a slightly different one. The impit chief, meanwhile, is stripped of his armor and then patched up too, in the same moment that Wyatt is already good to go again. Admittedly, I have not fully decided what to do with this prisoner yet. Let me know in the comments what you think we should do with prisoners in general. I think there could be multiple interesting ways of how a colony with charitable beliefs would approach taking prisoners, so let me know what you think this approach could be for the believers of Boyo. As the night then sets in, we have good news and bad news. The bad news first, the Earl of Bronze has unfortunately developed an infection, but with the good medical care that we are used to from Kevin, this should not be life-threatening. The good news then, we have some more Ambrosia Sprouts, we already had some last episode, so at some point in the not-so-distant future we should have a healthy influx, but for the time being the plants still need a bit more time to fully mature. More bad news then, sick of his sickness, Light goes on a food binge, which is actually without any consequences whatsoever, because apart from a few bits of pemmican we currently have no food, as Took's hunting trip was so rudely interrupted. 
A few hours later then, a potentially interesting way to handle our prisoner appears, as for the first time in this series the Royal Tribute Collector arrives. Now to be honest, I'm not entirely sure if the believers of Boyo would be into selling prisoners, and for this one to be sold we would need him to be able to walk anyway, and there is no guarantee that the caravan sticks around until that happens. In the meantime, Took gets our food production back on track and Grizzly Bear Matrix gives birth to yet another baby. We are naming this one Jen, after the patron supporter of the same name. At this point though, I think it is safe to say that the bear's time with us is slowly running out. Now that we also have donkeys and an elephant, it's just getting a bit too much. Still, I don't want to get rid of them too unceremoniously. So let me know what you think we should do with them. Should we just release them into the wild? Should we kill them or should we sell them? Either way, I think it's gotten to the point where their numbers are just overwhelming us, especially since most of them are still young and not capable of fighting or hauling. So let me know what you think their fate should be as we keep going. In the evening, it is time to once again confirm Kevin as the Speaker of Sacrifice. By imprisoning him, that role was unfortunately also taken away from him, but after a short two-hour procedure, he is back at it. And his first task as the Speaker of Sacrifice is to install that new field hand we acquired, and it will go on none other than Psycaster Light. Now, this might seem like an unusual choice, but Light actually has a Bite Scar on his right hand that would get removed this way, which in turn would slightly increase his manipulation stat. And not only that, at level 8 and with a minor passion, Light is actually our most capable plant worker, and this should speed up his work so that he can get back to what he does best, meditating to raise his psi focus. The operation then a complete success, raising Kevin's medical skill to level 14, and his medical aptitude was apparently also enough to speed up the recovery of our prisoner, who can now at least walk again, although the Imperial Caravan has already moved on. So for the time being we'll go with the next best thing, and that is to convert him to the Believers of Boyo. We'll have to see how well that goes, but I think it would be a good way to offer him redemption for his sins. In our common room, meanwhile, Squigs is constructing a sarcophagus. Don't worry though, it's not for our prisoner. Instead, it will now house the first victim of our failed charity attempt, the small pigskin child Sao. Unfortunately, a sarcophagi cannot be moved and I was too lazy to install another mod for it, so Light will now have to extract Sao's skeletal remains and then bury them again in the new sarcophagus. As a psychopath, he just seems like the right man for this job. And this now also allows him to meditate in our new base, alongside Wyatt, by the way, who will now also meditate right here. At this point, the Nature Shrine is no longer giving him any bonuses whatsoever, so meditating at an object not of his focus type will have the same effect. And perhaps as a result of getting in touch with whatever is left of Sal, Light now receives an inspiration, a taming inspiration, which is actually not that useful for him. His animal handling skill is only a 4, and there are not that many animals in the game that he could tame with this, because unfortunately, despite the inspiration, the skill still needs to match the difficulty of the animal. So no, we can sadly not translate this into another free elephant, but perhaps you still have an idea on what else we could use it on. Worst case scenario, we'll just tame an easy animal like the alpaca and slaughter it immediately at least that would make hunting a little bit more convenient. The rest of the day meanwhile remains rather uneventful, as you can see we have moved pretty much everything from our old base into the new one. The only thing still over in the old place are the not so important bits of storage, as well as the entire Baron's bedroom, but we have plans for that. Before we can put those in motion however, we receive another charity quest and this time it's an actual one. A forester from another faction has crash landed in the jungle, and taking a closer look at him we can see he's an interesting kind. The ugly and creepy breathing traits definitely do not make him the most pleasant person to be around, but he's got some good skills, once again in what I consider to be the workshop department. And that is no surprise, because this guy's xenotype is Genie, which is very much designed to be this kind of engineer person. Very fragile, with the delicate and extra pain genes, but extremely good at crafting and intellectual work. This could definitely make for a fine addition to our ranks. And even if it doesn't, we will of course still rescue him. Even if he decides to leave again after we patch him up, we should still get an ideology development point as well as a faction relation bonus out of this. Now, with both of our patients patched up, we can squeaks construct a bedroll. A bedroll that is then shortly after used on a caravan, as we are now sending Speaker of Sacrifice Kevin out to have peace talks with the Red Pond people. If we can convince them to no longer be hostile, that would be a good first step towards acquiring the next piece of the Arconexus map. And thankfully, now that we have some donkeys, the travel time is reduced from three and a half to roughly two days, and I'm hoping that we can survive without Kevin for that long. 
By the way, yes, we could have also used our elephant, the Earl of Bronze, to have Kevin majestically ride into the meeting. Unfortunately, though, the elephant is still injured and I would like him to make a full recovery first. And so, Kevin and his donkey now ride forth as Light takes over converting duties. With an abysmal social skill of only four, however, the results are disappointing. In the early evening, then, our pod crash survivor is already fully healed, and it looks like he will not join us after all. Instead, slowly, very slowly, he is now walking back home. And it actually takes him all the way until the middle of the night to reach the map edge, at which point then nothing happens, which is curious. We should definitely receive the confirmation that a charity quest has been fulfilled at this point, and that should come with one ideology development point as well as with a small mood bonus. I am not 100% sure about the faction relation bonus. Either way, this is not what's supposed to happen. And I once again checked this multiple times and the same thing kept happening. And this time there is sadly also no error message to dig into. So I am starting to get a bit of a mixed feeling about the state of the save file. I will of course always be able to add the desired effects in via dev mode, but I would prefer if this did not become a regular thing. Now, on the next day, our currently unoccupied bedroom becomes our prison cell, and we want our prisoner here to have at least some dignity, which is why Wyatt is currently making an elephant leather outfit for him. Just shirt and pants, but I don't think the guy has to run around naked. In the top left corner of the base, we are also currently digging out a new hospital. I actually think that down the line, a well-equipped hospital should be one of the core places of the base. I think this is what the believers of Boyo would want to invest their resources in. On the next morning, then, we receive a quest offering us one such potential investment. 14 Glitter World Medicine strike me as the reward the believers of Boyo would be after. And so, let us accept the activation of a psychic droner machine protected by six mechanoids. Thankfully, the droner is once again tuned to females. Otherwise, I would be a bit more hesitant about accepting this. Our prisoner, then, fully healed, but we'll keep him here for the time being. And as soon as Light has finished breakfast, we then accept the droner quest, as Light will be part of the caravan to solve this problem. Thankfully, the quest location is close nearby, and so we can now send out the menacing dream team of Light and Wyatt, together with Glomus and the Earl of Bronze as riding animals, which brings the travel time down to only half a day. The Glitter World Medicine then is brought into storage immediately, as our small caravan leaves the map, leaving Took, Squeaks and Baby Ellie all alone in the jungle. And, well, what better time could there be for an outbreak of malaria? Thankfully, Squeaks at least is not affected, but Took and our prisoner are, and so we now rely on Squeaks and the quality of our medicine to solve this problem. With a medical skill of only two, I don't think we can expect much from her. To make matters even more interesting, we then also have a local boar go mad, and a few seconds later we also have three thrombos wander in, and unfortunately no means of hunting them efficiently at the moment. On top of all of that then, the peace talks are a complete failure. Kevin actually makes our relations with the Red Pawn people even worse. On the bright side, he at least gains 6000 experience points in the social skill, but what a waste of time this was. Against the boar at least, we can rely on Squeaks, or rather her army of bears, with one of the youngest, Cobalt, immediately going to chew on the animal, but I guess that is life in the jungle. As Squeaks then patches up one of our bears, we have cargo pods arrive. Inside, 23 units of medicine that we will gladly accept. At least on that front, we are doing quite well at the moment. In the early evening, our small caravan then also arrives at the Psychic Droner site. The location of the machine is quickly identified, and so are its protectors. We are dealing with six Militor mechanoids here. These were introduced in the Biotech DLC, and they are pesky little creatures. Equipped with a shotgun, they are only capable of dealing damage in close ranges. They are also not too heavily armored and will get absolutely slaughtered in any melee fight, which is exactly why I had hoped that these guys would be here because now we can employ the simple strategy of skipping them to their death, meaning right in front of Wyatt, who is already waiting with his plasma sword. And as you can see, they do not stand a chance whatsoever. Yes, ultimately Wyatt is taking a few small scratches, but that is nothing that he's not used to, and the much more fragile light remains completely unharmed, and with that, the difficult part of this quest is already completed. At this point, we can already send Light and Donkey Glomus back home, as a battered and bruised Wyatt stays a little while longer to make quick work of the Drona machine. In the return trip, him and the Earl of Bronze can then take the loot with them, a component, some steel and plus steel, who knows what that might eventually be good for. 
Back in the base, meanwhile, our malaria situation is far from under control. Despite using regular medicine, the disease is progressing rapidly, so for this round of treatment we have Squix switch over to the good stuff. On the following morning then, we also get another chance to see whether or not the charity mechanics have fixed themselves, as we have yet another refugee crash land, this time he's a member of the Empire. As you can see, once again we are looking at someone very skilled in all things crafting, so let's get him into our brand new and super luxurious hospital. Well, at least the bed has an air of royalty around it, the rest is still very much a work in progress. The injuries meanwhile nothing life-threatening, so Squeaks can take it slowly. Still, we are using regular medicine for this, as this is what we currently have the most of. Just as Quix then applies another dose of Glitter World medicine against malaria, Light returns home, and a few moments later so does Wyatt, who unfortunately had to needlessly suffer a bit on the return trip, because I accidentally gave all the meals to Light's caravan. In the evening then he receives some medical treatment too, but not for long, because our prisoner has unfortunately decided to escape. Well, we did give him one chance at redemption and it looks like he won't take it, so now he will have to face the consequences, and those consequences wield a plasma sword. By using Wyatt's beck and side cast, we can also make sure that no one escapes today, and well, the fight goes as I had feared. After being repeatedly stabbed, our prisoner dies, so much for an attempt to convince him to change his ways. For now, his dead body will actually be left right here on the floor for everyone to see. I suppose we'll have to construct a second sarcophagus here. I think this would be a fitting candidate to not just be thrown into the river. Believe it or not, just a few moments later then we have yet another crashed refugee. This time it is a nervous and greedy fast learner, mostly skilled in shooting, melee and animal handling, and this time also seriously injured. So since one bedroom was just vacated, let's fill it again immediately. We'll have Light skip himself all the way to our target and then rescue her. In this case though, since she comes from a hostile faction, rescuing actually means capturing her. Either way, we put her into bed in time, and our emergency doctor Squeaks can immediately go to work. Meanwhile, with our patient took, it looks like the malaria is slowly but steadily under control. One more dose of Glitter World medicine here should ensure his survival, I think, especially with Kevin soon to return too. In the afternoon, meanwhile, we can watch Light and his new field hand busy at work, harvesting some rice, or at least sometimes successfully doing so. We'll talk more about that in a second, for now we have our first donkey birth. Yes, Glomus and Loris have been busy, and so we can now welcome Donkey Fall Blossom to the colony. On the topic of Light's field work, meanwhile, it has to be noted that as much as the field hand now increases his planned work speed, it does not really increase his success harvesting anything. That is still very much affected by the fact that he is completely blind, so we should probably more rely on him to plant stuff than to harvest it. Luckily, in the evening, Kevin's caravan returns and with that another person capable of field work. To celebrate his arrival, we also receive a very fitting Psychic Soothe. A Psychic Soothe that benefits Psycaster Light with a lovely plus 50 mood bonus. An hour before midnight then, we have yet another Grizzly Bear be born. This one will now go by the name of Level Boy, after patron supporter Level Boy 14. And finally, we wrap things up with Kevin administering herbal medicine to treat Tux malaria. And the new tent quality of 70% here, that should be enough. I think that just gives us one more reason to not send Kevin out on a caravan anytime soon. And with that, I think we have reached a good point to make the cut in today's episode. I want to apologize that a few things seemed buggy or glitchy with quests and rituals. I'm still looking into ways to fix them, but again, I would really appreciate your input. And of course, that also goes for all other questions I've asked throughout the episode. In the meantime, you can see it, we have more fan art this week from Isaac Young, a piece titled Kevin is not happy it's a girl, because yes indeed, our resident misogynist probably would have hoped for the birth of a boy. We also have Took upset that he can't be with Squigs to raise Ellie, Light angry that he has to attend the event in the first place, not caring about any of this, and, and I'm quoting all of this from the email that Isaac sent me, Wyatt just kind of standing there, being ugly as sin. So thank you very much for sending me this, and if you want to send in some artwork as well, then as always the best way to do so is via email to pete at petecomplete.com, or if you are a patron supporter then feel free to join the Pete Complete Discord and share your artwork over there. And that's it for today, as always I hope you enjoyed the episode, and if you did then I would be very happy if you could leave a thumbs up. And as always, if you like what I'm doing and want to support me and my channel further, then you can of course subscribe to stay up to date and get notified when the next video goes up, grab some merch over on shop.petecomplete.com, or get your name into the series too by supporting me over on Patreon. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.